you very much for for the introduction um so um yeah welcome to this um, uh, session on the use of um yeah deep machine learning for uh, genome uh, annotation and uh, yeah as already uh, pointed out by uh, maria um aspar and i we will uh, try to give you some more insight uh, into the usage of uh, yeah, multi-layered and deep neural networks, uh, and this for the use case of uh, splice site uh, detection. So uh, yeah, maybe uh, just a, a very brief uh, introduction. Uh, so so uh, my name is uh, Wesley Deneve. I am uh, a computer scientist, and uh, at the moment I'm working for uh, both the Center for Biosystems and, and Biotech Data Science um, of the global campus of and Ghent University in uh, Korea. And I'm also with the so-called uh, IB lab, the so-called Internet Technology and Data Science Lab of Ghent University in, in Belgium. Um, as far, uh, he's at the moment uh, working towards uh, a doctoral degree in, in, in the area of uh, computer science uh, engineering. And his doctoral research uh, focuses on the use of deep machine learning for uh, biological uh, sequence analysis. And uh, as far, he's also with uh, the Center for Biosystems and Biotech Data Science and uh, ID Lab. Um, so what is the structure of um, our session? So uh, I myself, I will start with an introductory uh, lecture and taking the form of uh, slides, also supported by uh, some written notes. And after my uh, lecture, we will then have uh, a short break and this break will then be followed by a hands-on tutorial that will be uh, supervised by uh, ASPAR, where that uh, tutorial uh, will be run uh, by making use of uh, Google uh, Colab. Okay, and then the structure of uh, my theory lecture. Um, so um, I will first uh, start with uh, explaining uh, our study goals. Uh, I will then also introduce uh, the use case in that we are targeting splice site uh, detection. I will then also say something more about yeah, the basics of uh, deep uh, neural networks. And after that, uh, we will have a look at uh, the use of a deep learning workflow um, to detect uh, uh, splice sites in DNA sequences. And then after that, and I will also wrap up uh, my lecture with a number of concluding uh, remarks. Um, I will also uh, explain uh, some practicalities uh, regarding our uh, tutorial. And if time permits, and then there's also room for uh, a Q&A. So to start with um, our study goals. So with this uh, session, we would like to give you some uh, more insight uh, into a full uh, machine learning workflow uh, for genome annotation. And uh, in this context, we will have a look at uh, the input and that um, is expected by uh, a neural network. We will also have a look at the training of a neural network, and we will also have a look at the output generated by a neural network. And so what are the uh, predictions uh, made? And uh, a second goal of this session is also to learn how to correctly interpret uh, the generated output, okay, how to uh, understand the predictions made. And so this is a, that about uh, how to do a proper uh, performance uh, assessment. And then of course, uh, a third uh, major goal is also to give you some, some hands-on experience, to give you some uh, practical uh, intuitions with uh, a real-world uh, use case, and in this case, uh, splice site uh, detection. So let's have a look at our uh, use case. Um, so from a more general point of view, uh, we are dealing here with uh, automatic uh, genome annotation. And uh, in that regard, we can actually make a distinction between, on the one hand, uh, structural annotation and also functional annotation of a genome. So in terms of uh, structural annotation, and then you can think about uh, finding the building blocks uh, of a genome. And so to, to learn how a, a genome is uh, structured in terms of uh, chromosomes and genes, uh, exons, introns, and so on and so forth. And uh, functional annotation, and uh, this is actually about um, 
determining and the function of a particular building block. So for instance, uh, what is the biological function of a gene or to what extent can a certain gene be associated with a certain uh, disease? And uh, in our research, we, we do that kind of uh, genome annotation by making use of uh, computational models, uh, where these models uh, learn to automatically perform predictions, and where these models uh, are typically built by only making use of uh, sequence information. And so we typically only make use of the order of the nucleotides in a DNA sequence. And uh, a second aspect we also pay attention to is understanding in the predictions made in, by our computational models, because in, by having a good understanding of these predictions, by uh, understanding how these predictions are linked to certain uh, features of the genome, yeah, we should also be able to get a, a better insight into the underlying biology and where molecular biology can be quite uh, complicated. And here I can also point out, so uh, we will focus on one particular use case, namely uh, splice site detection. But basically the, the workflow that we are going to discuss is, is quite general in nature. And the techniques that, that we will pay attention to, um, they can actually be easily transferred to other use cases that are related to uh, genome annotation. So um, let us now have a look at uh, our use case and um, splice site uh, detection. And as most of you uh, may know, okay, so we have a DNA sequence. Within a DNA sequence, we can have uh, a gene. And then after uh, transcription, we get a messenger RNA. And then at the level of that messenger RNA, we can see different building blocks. And so we have the so-called uh, untranslated uh, region, in this case, to the left and to the right. And then in between these uh, untranslated uh, regions, we also have this alternating sequence of um, exons and introns. And then in the next step, again, from a, a very simple point of view, and these uh, exons, they are uh, put together, and so they are spliced together. And these exons are then, in the end, translated into a protein, where that protein and then fulfills a, a certain uh, biological uh, function. And uh, here, I can also point out that uh, for this session, so for our research, we are actually mainly interested in the boundaries in between exons and, and introns. And these boundaries and these transitions are known as so-called uh, splice sites. And uh, in that context, we also make a distinction between so-called donor sites and acceptor sites. And so when we go from an exon to an intron, and then we talk about a donor site, and when we go from an intron to an exon, then we talk about a so-called acceptor site. And again, it is these boundaries and that we would like to detect and by making use of a deep neural network. And uh, in this respect, I can also point out that uh, these different types of uh, splice sites, donors and acceptors, uh, they also come with their own features and with their own problem and characteristics. And that's also why in practice, uh, we are yeah, uh, seeing uh, or we are um, dealing with their detection as uh, two different uh, prediction tasks where each prediction task comes with its own uh, data set and to build the corresponding predictive model. Uh, so here on the slide, you can see uh, an excerpt uh, of the data set uh, that we are making use of and to, to build our uh, predictive models. And uh, yeah, let me try to, to explain a bit what you uh, see here. So basically you see um, a fragment uh, of a simple text file where that text file consists of uh, several lines of text. And so here on the slide, you can basically see uh, four lines of text, uh, where each line of text uh, corresponds with a DNA sequence. And uh, in the middle of each um, uh, slide, or, or in the middle of each uh, DNA sequence, you can also see um, the D nucleotide AG. 
um, because uh, that uh, nucleotide is basically uh, associated with the so-called uh, acceptor uh, splice site. And so basically, maybe you can go back to the previous slide. And so basically, um, when you have looked at um, the transition from an exon uh, to an intron, at the level of that transition, you can, you can almost always find the nucleotide pair GU at the level of the mRNA. And when you have a look at the transition from an intron to an exon, there you can typically find in the nucleotide pair AG, where AG is basically associated with an acceptor and site. And it is that an AG that you can also see here again in the data set. So basically we have, uh, in this case, uh, four DNA sequences with in the middle um, that nucleotide pair AG. And so uh, basically uh, with uh, these uh, DNA sequences, we're going to have to look at the detection of uh, acceptor uh, splice sites. And you can also see that to the left and to the right of that nucleotide pair, we also have some context uh, where that context uh, takes the form of um, a DNA fragment and that, uh, in this case, uh, typically comes with a fixed length of 200 uh, nucleotides. And the idea is also here that uh, in that context, to the left and to the right, that we will be able to detect certain patterns where these patterns can be linked to the occurrence of a possible acceptor uh, splice site. I can also point out that in the data set in that we have, in that each DNA sequence is also uh, labeled, uh, with, um, labeled with information whether that DNA sequence uh, corresponds to a true splice site or a false uh, splice site. And where basically a, a true splice site is also known as a positive example, where uh, a false splice site is also known as a so-called negative example. And so here on the slide, okay, when you have a look at this uh, excerpt of our data set, we can see two true splice sites. We can also see um, in the middle, and we can also see uh, two false uh, splice sites. And the idea is now that okay, by giving these labeled examples as an input into a, a deep neural network, and that that deep neural network will be able and to learn how a certain splice site, how it looks like. Uh, something else I'd also would like to point out is that um, there's already a lot of information actually available about uh, splice sites. And so splice sites are basically an already an, a well-studied uh, topic. And um, I will also uh, try to give you some context here by making use of an example. So here on the slide, okay, you can basically see an intron followed by an exon and again followed by an intron. Okay, so here at the level of the transition between the intron and the exon, you again have an acceptor splice site. And here okay, we have, of course, a so-called donor splice site. Um, as briefly mentioned before, okay, from uh, experiments, from, from previous studies, we know that at the level of the transition of an intron towards an exon, and that it is very common and to find the nucleotide pair AG. And so in that case, when that is the case, here we talk about the canonical splice site. And we also know that at the level of the donor splice site, at the level of that transition, and that it is quite common to find the nucleotide pair uh, GD. However, it is also well known that in front of an acceptor splice site at a certain distance, where that distance can typically vary, that you can also find a so-called polypyrimidine tract, and so a feature, and uh, where that polypyrimidine tract is characterized by the occurrence of a lot of T nucleotides. On a similar note, again, experts, and based on uh, experimentation, based on previous studies, they also know that at a certain distance from an acceptor splice site and further away from the acceptor splice site, that you can also find a so-called branch point. And a branch point is again, a molecular feature 
um, that plays a role uh, when, when performing uh, splicing, and where it is also known that this branch point is characterized by the following pattern, okay, by having the pattern CT followed by an arbitrary nucleotide and then followed by the A uh, nucleotide. And uh, again, basically, uh, the goal of um, yeah, deep machine learning here is that uh, by making use of, in the end, a deep neural network, and also by making use of um, a large data set uh, of um, example splice sites, and that our deep neural network is able to automatically learn Okay, what are the characteristics? What are the features of a particular splice site? And so here uh, you can again see uh, an example uh, data set labeled examples, uh, false uh, splice sites, and also true splice sites. And in this case, uh, this is a data set uh, that can be used to detect uh, donor splice sites. And here again, the hope is that uh, by making use of uh, a deep neural network, and that that network, when it has a look at this uh, data set, that it will, for instance, be able to learn that immediately in front of this nucleotide pair GT, and that it is actually quite common and to see the pattern CAG, and that immediately after the nucleotide pair GT, that it's also quite common and to find the pattern AAGT. So um, yeah, that was basically um, our use case. This was splice site detection. It's a, it's a, a use case uh, related to uh, structural uh, genome annotation. And this is all about finding uh, the boundaries between introns and exons, where introns and exons are the basic building blocks of a gene. So in what follows, and let us now have uh, a more detailed look at uh, neural networks. And um, so here on the slide, you can see an example of um, a traditional, of a, a regular uh, neural network. And um, this neural network it can basically be seen and more from a computer science point of view as a kind of computational graph, and as a kind of uh, layered network in which uh, certain computations are going to take place. And uh, specifically, and when you have a look at this uh, neural network, and then we can identify uh, four different layers. And so to the left, we have a so-called uh, input layer consisting of three input uh, neurons labeled X1, X2, and X3. And completely to the right, we also have an output layer with uh, two so-called uh, output uh, neurons. And um, where basically, uh, uh, Y1 it will be associated with the probability in that we have a false uh, splice site, uh, where Y2 will be associated with the probability in that we have a, a true uh, splice site. And then in between uh, the input layer and the output layer, we also have two so-called uh, hidden layers, uh, where each hidden layer consists of uh, four uh, neurons. And these layers are called hidden because typically as a user of a neural network, we only see the input and the output, but we typically do not have um, a detailed look or a detailed understanding of the computations that are being executed by the hidden layers. When you have a look at this uh, neural network, I can also point out that this is a so-called fully connected uh, neural network, because in principle, each neuron in a particular layer is connected to each other neuron in the preceding layer, and also to, to each uh, other neuron in the succeeding layer. And this neural network is also called a feed-forward uh, neural network, because the input uh, will always flow, in this case, from the left to the right. And so there are no loops. This is not what what is also called a recurrent uh, neural network. So as mentioned before, and so we have a computational graph here uh, with um, nodes that take the form of artificial neurons, and where these artificial neurons will basically execute uh, all kinds of computations, and where to some extent, these artificial neurons will also mimic the behavior simplified uh, of a biological neuron. 
So in the next step, okay, let us have a more detailed look at what an artificial uh, neuron is uh, doing. And so let us have a look here at the yeah, bottom left uh, corner of the slide. And so here you see an artificial uh, neuron in, in more uh, yeah, mathematical detail. So here we can see that we again have uh, three inputs, x1, x2, and x3. And here we can also see that each input is uh, basically associated with a weight, w1, w2, and w3, where that weight will say something about the importance of that input for making, in the end, very good predictions. You can also see that in the next step, we also have a linear combination of the inputs and also the uh, corresponding weights, where that uh, linear combination is also adjusted by making use of a so-called bias term, where that bias term will have an impact on the ease um, with which a neuron in the end is going to fire. It will, ha it will have an impact on the ease um, with which uh, a neuron is going to generate a, a certain an output. And that result, okay, so the outcome of the linear combination adjusted with the bias, is then given as an input in the next step to a so-called activation function, okay, where that activation function, in the end, they will produce the final output of the neuron. Uh, in practice, you can also make use of um, different uh, activation functions like in the sigmoid function or the logistic function, or you can also make use of the um, hyperbolic tangent. Okay, but these days, um, when making use of um, deep neural networks, it is quite common okay, to make use of the so-called uh, rectified uh, linear unit activation function, okay, because that activation function comes with an, a number of nice properties that uh, make it possible to typically uh, train much larger uh, neural networks. And that activation function is actually quite um, intuitive to understand. And so the uh, mathematical form can be seen here. And so it's basically the max of zero and x. And uh, what you can see here is the following, namely that negative inputs are simply mapped onto zero and uh, positive inputs, and they are kept. And that's basically the semantics of this uh, rectified linear unit activation function. Uh, what I can also point out is the following. And so when we uh, jump back to the output layer, and so we have y1 and y2, and, um, and by default, and the, and the output they generate is also the output of the unbounded uh, rectified uh, linear unit function. But it is also quite common to apply the so-called softmax function, which you can see here, to the output of uh, these neurons. Where that softmax function, which is also, which is also known as the uh, normalized exponential function, where that so softmax function has the, the nice property that the unbounded outputs are mapped onto a value between zero and one. And so this means that the softmax function basically generates um, yeah, probabilities of, at the level of y1 and y2. And these probabilities, in the end, and they often make it easier to understand or to interpret and the output of the neural network. Um, I can also uh, share that and so once we have uh, defined a certain uh, architecture, and like the one that, that we can see here, then typically in the next step and to start with, we're also going to assign um, random values into all the parameters of our neural network. And so we are going to assign random values to the weights and the biases. And that means that uh, at first, and that our neural network is also basically going to produce uh, random predictions, which are going to be um, of a low quality, of course. Uh, but of course, we also have, as you may remember, uh, a data set with uh, labeled uh, examples. And um, based on the information uh, that is uh, available in, in that data set, uh, we can then fine tune uh, the weights and the biases in, in a neural network. 
because in the end, for the examples in our data set, we know the correct predictions because they have been labeled these examples. And based on these correct predictions, we can fine tune our weights and biases. And we typically do so if I make use of a stepwise approach, if I make use of an iterative approach, okay, where that iterative approach is often implemented by making use of okay, two mathematical techniques okay, that are known as uh, gradient descent and also um, back propagation. Okay, so um, here on the slide, um, and what you basically see is the following. Um, and so when you have a look at a, a neural network, a neural network is basically a mathematical tool. Right? To, to, to some extent, it's actually a, a function approximator. And um, yeah, given the mathematical nature of a neural network, um, yeah, it is also necessary to provide a neural network with numerical input. But of course, for our use case, and we want to make use of DNA sequences, and DNA sequences are textual or symbolic in nature. So in the end, this means that uh, this symbolic representation, so the sequence of nucleotides, um, needs to be converted into something numerical. And uh, one way to do so is to make use of a so-called one-hot encoding, and that is also uh, illustrated on the slide. And where essentially uh, the A nucleotide is mapped onto the numerical vector 1000, where C is mapped onto the vector 0100, uh, 0, 0, and so on and so forth. And so basically, if I make use of a one hot encoding, we can convert a symbolic input like a DNA sequence into a sequence of numerical uh, vectors. And that can be fed into our deep neural network. And then in the next step, and so once we have that uh, numerical uh, representation, we can give that entire input into uh, a certain uh, neuron. Uh, where that neuron then also comes with, uh, in this case, uh, a large uh, weight matrix, okay, and where these weights are then assigned in an element-wise fashion to uh, the different uh, inputs. And so here you can see that in the weight matrix, um, yeah, almost entirely consists of weights with a value of zero, with the exception of three elements. And there we have one. And uh, basically, uh, these three elements, uh, they correspond into these three locations and in the input. Okay, so basically, uh, when here, uh, when we perform an element-wise uh, calculation of on the one hand, uh, the inputs here, and then the corresponding weights here, then we will see that our neuron, in this case, will produce an activation and that is equal to three. And so one times one plus one times one and plus one times one. And uh, essentially what we see here is that this particular neuron okay, with this kind of weight matrix, well, this neuron is able to detect the pattern TGT in this uh, input uh, DNA uh, sequence. Okay, so um, when we uh, want to find a, a particular pattern, and in biology, in that context, we also talk about a motive on a fixed position in a certain DNA sequence, and then um, yeah, there's no problem okay, when uh, we want to do so if I make use of a regular and uh, fully connected uh, feed-forward uh, neural network, okay, like in the one that we have discussed before. However, okay, when we want to find uh, a single pattern okay, like uh, TGT on any position in a DNA sequence, and then we are going to run in some difficulties, and then we are going to run into some redundancy, this is actually illustrated by uh, this example on the slide. And so here, we again have the numerical representation of our uh, DNA sequence. And uh, essentially, when we want to find the pattern PGT on uh, any position, we basically need to associate a dedicated neuron okay, with each possible input position. 
and where that dedicated neuron also needs to come with a corresponding and complete uh, weight matrix okay, from a simple point of view. And, um, and that, of course, introduces a lot of redundancy because we need a neuron for each position. And for each neuron, we also need to determine, we also need to learn a very large uh, weight matrix that can be used to detect the pattern DGT. So that is not very efficient. And that is in the end uh, why uh, people uh, um, yeah, put forward in so-called uh, convolutional uh, neural networks. And where these convolutional neural networks have a nice property that they enable um, learning a single pattern and this for any position uh, in the input. And they do so by making use of uh, a new type of neuron and that is called a convolutional filter. And where that convolutional filter is going to replace a regular uh, neuron. Now let me try to explain this. So here in input, we again have our symbolic DNA sequence, and we also have the corresponding numerical representation of that DNA sequence by making use of a one-hot encoding. And here on the slide, you can now also see a so-called convolutional filter. And so with um, basically and three uh, weight factors. And that convolutional filter is now going to be shifted over the input and by making use of a sliding window approach. And by making use of that convolutional filter, we will then generate a so-called activation. And so here you're going to perform an element-wise um, multiplication of the uh, input symbols and the, course, and the corresponding or collocated weights. And in this case, we get an activation of zero. And here we're going to repeat that operation by making use of a sliding window. And in the end, hey, you can also see that hey, when we go to the pattern TGT in our input DNA sequence, and there hey, when we perform the necessary calculations and that we are able in, in this case to, to generate maximum activation of three, and where that value actually uh, signals or tells us in that we have found the pattern TGT in our input and DNA sequence. So what was uh, visualized here, and this is also something that can be mathematically expressed uh, as follows, and, and that is something that then can also be described if I make a use of uh, source code. And um, yeah, basically hey, what you do is the following. And so you have um, yeah, an input matrix hey, of symbols. Uh, you then apply a, a weight matrix hey, to these symbols, uh, shift where that weight matrix is shifted over uh, uh, the input. And in the end, uh, by doing so, hey, you're generating a, a vector hey, of so-called uh, activations. And from a very practical point of view, um, I can also point out that, um, yeah, and, and especially from an uh, implementation perspective, and that it is uh, often very convenient uh, to have an activation uh, vector uh, that has the same dimension um, as the um, as an input vector. And uh, yeah, to uh, enable that, uh, what can you do? Well, you can add padding into your input. So here you can see that. The DNA sequence is uh, padded with zeros to the left, and it's also padded with zeros to the right. Yeah, and that makes it possible uh, to obtain an activation vector uh, that comes with the same dimension as basically uh, the input uh, DNA uh, sequence. OK, so I went having a look at uh, a convolutional uh, neural network, uh, which are uh, these days uh, uh, quite popular in, in a lot of fields in, in a lot of use cases. Uh, apart from um, convolutional filters, a convolutional neural network uh, will often and uh, also come with so-called pooling layers. Yeah, and where these pooling layers will make it possible to uh, reduce the dimensionality of your data. Yeah, and that will add to the efficiency of your network. And um, yeah, pooling is, is typically done okay, by having a look at uh, spatially uh, neighboring uh, activations and by then summarizing okay, these uh, spatially uh, neighboring activations into typically uh, one value. 
And that summarization, I mean, that can be done by, for instance, uh, using the average of the different activations, or this can also be done I mean, by making use of a maximum operation. And in the latter context, and we also talk about uh, max uh, pooling. And that is also illustrated by, again, this example on the slide. So again, we have our input DNA sequence. We also have the corresponding numerical representation padded to the left and to the right. We also have, in this case, our convolutional filter. And that has been designed in such a way that it can be used to detect, to detect in the pattern uh, TGT, because for that pattern, a, a maximum um, a activation, a, a maximum response it will be uh, generated. And then, of course, by uh, shifting that filter uh, over the input, we get this activation vector. And now, in the next step, by making use of max pooling, we can summarize that an activation vector into another vector that comes with a lower dimensionality. And this is also done by making use of a sliding window approach that in this case always has, has a look at three spatially neighboring activations. So in this case, one zero one, uh, one zero zero. So here we take the maximum of course, and uh, resulting in uh, one. And then we go to um, yeah, the next uh, three uh, spatially neighboring activations. These can also be summarized uh, into one and so on and so forth. Yeah, and that way, and so basically by making use of uh, max pooling, we can, as you can clearly see here, we can reduce uh, the uh, yeah, dimensionality uh, of um, our data. And here you can still see, and when you have a look at this, um, yeah, summarized an uh, activation vector, we still have in uh, the maximum response. We can still see that, uh, that yeah, a neuron uh, was maximally triggered in this case uh, for the pattern uh, TGT. Uh, so basically um, with what I have explained in the previous slides about uh, neural networks and, and also about uh, convolutional filters and, and also about um, uh, max pooling, we can now build um, um, yeah, first uh, um, yeah, convolutional neural network architecture uh, that can be used uh, to detect uh, these fly sites. Yeah, and that architecture, we will also have a look at that architecture in more detail uh, later on in, in the tutorial. And that architecture uh, basically uh, looks as follows. So first, uh, we have uh, an input uh, layer with a certain size. And that input layer is then followed by a convolutional layer, a max pooling layer, again, a convolutional layer, and in the end, again, a max pooling layer. And here, I can also point out that this first part of the overall neural network, well, this first part is responsible for so-called feature learning, for so-called motive detection. And so basically, in this part of the neural network, um, given access to a sufficiently high number of labeled examples, will be able uh, to learn um, those features and that characterize uh, a certain uh, splice site. And then in the end, we also have this uh, second part of the uh, example uh, neural network. And so first we have a so-called uh, flatten layer and to go from um, yeah, a two-dimensional um, um, uh, form into a one-dimensional shape. And then we also have a fully connected layer followed by a softmax layer and to perform classification. And so in this case, to um, detect, and so based on the features learned and, and based on the activations uh, produced, and to, to detect whether we are dealing with uh, a true splice site or with a false uh, splice site. And in terms of machine learning, hey, we also say that this second part of the network is responsible for so-called hypothesis learning, which refers to classification or regression. And um, here I can also point out that we now also have arrived at maybe, in my opinion, in the, the strongest uh, characteristic of um, deep machine learning, namely that deep machine learning is able to perform 
end-to-end -end learning. Yeah, so basically, okay, when, when you have a deep neural network and when you have access to a sufficiently high number of uh, labeled examples, then with that network, you can automatically learn those features that are relevant for your problem. And with that network, you can then also classify these features. Okay, so end-to-end so end -end learning, and that is basically, in my opinion, in the most important advantage and the, the most important or the strongest characteristic of deep machine learning. And then maybe to wrap up in this part um, of, of um, uh, my talk, um, I also would like to point out that uh, CNNs were initially defined uh, for doing image analysis and uh, for computer vision and uh, for um, yeah, giving um, uh, computers a, a good understanding of uh, what can basically be seen in, uh, in an image. And it's only later on that people also noticed that uh, CNNs could also be used for natural language processing, NLP, and also for yeah, omics uh, data analysis. And here, of course, on this slide, you can see a simple example in that also intuitive, intuitively illustrates how a CNN can be used in to detect low-level patterns in an image. So here to the left, you can see a binary image and that consists of uh, black and white pixels. And so basically you can see that we have a, a mirrored uh, tree here. And you can also see that we are making use of uh, two different filters. The first filter, and that has been defined in such a way that it can detect uh, right bottom uh, corners. And then a second filter that has been defined in such a way that it is able to detect the end of a line where the end of a line in this case it goes from the right to the left. And when you apply these filters into the given input, and then you basically get the following two and activation maps. And then if I make a use of in the ReLU activation function, and as you may remember, in the, the ReLU activation function keeps positive values and maps uh, negative values on zero, you can basically clean up in these activation maps. And then you get the following results, which clearly show that in these filters and that they were indeed able to detect in these corresponding patterns with a certain strength in the input and image. Okay, so we had a look at splice side detection. And we also had a look at the basics of deep neural networks. So let us now have a look at the workflow and it can be used to uh, apply um, uh, deep learning and to um, yeah, a DNA sequence and for the purpose of uh, detecting uh, splice sites. And uh, when you have a look at this deep learning workflow, then uh, we can basically make a distinction between um, three major uh, parts. First of all, we have the pre-processing part, which and to some extent and can be seen as the most important part, or also that part in, in which you can spend a lot of time, often more time than the amount of time that you spend on defining and training your neural network. And uh, yeah, pre-processing is basically about yeah, getting to understand your data and also about uh, reformatting your data in such a way that uh, these data can be fed into your deep neural network. And uh, in this context, when you think about, um, for instance, image analysis, uh, a typical procedure there is that hey, when you have very high resolution images, hey, which is often the case in um, yeah, biomedical use cases, um, well, then you typically need to convert in these high quality images into um, lower resolution images, all having the same size. And that is um, one form of uh, pre-processing. And then in the next step, hey, we also have the training step. And in that training step, hey, we are going to uh, look for, or we're going to search for uh, good values hey, for the parameters of our neural network. And so we are going to look for uh, good values hey, for hey, the weights and, and the biases hey, of our uh, neural network. 
and where we will typically also make use of a large data set of uh, labeled uh, examples. And uh, in particular, so uh, during training, uh, we, will we will let the network uh, have a look at the labeled examples in, in, in the input data set. And um, one iteration uh, where the network has a, a look at all examples in the input and data set, one such iteration is also called an epoch in yeah, machine learning uh, speak. And yeah, the more epochs or the more iterations that you perform, typically uh, the better the prediction performance of our uh, neural network. Yeah, but of, and of course, um, yeah, when you train the neural network, and when, you, when you let the neural network have a look at in the labeled examples, and then, and then you will have, of course, uh, prediction errors. And in the beginning, in these prediction errors, which are also known as uh, losses or, or costs, in the beginning, they will be very large. But as the network gets trained, and these errors will become quite small. And once the overall prediction error has become sufficiently small, or once you have um, performed a sufficiently high number of epochs, and then you can stop uh, the training of your network. And in that case, of course, you obtain a trained network. And then once you have obtained a trained network, you can then have a look at uh, the usage uh, of that network in, in the real world. And you can then also have a look at in the um, yeah, evaluation of that network on a set of uh, new uh, unseen uh, examples. And uh, yeah, for the purpose of evaluation, um, you can make use of all kinds of metrics from very simple uh, and generic, you know, like uh, accuracy, which is quite popular, where accuracy basically refers to the percentage of correct predictions to yet more complicated metrics, where and these metrics are maybe specific for in the use case at hand. So, um, so let us have a look at the input and the output for the use case that we are targeting. Um, so as pointed out before, and so hey, when we want to apply a deep neural network into a DNA sequence, one thing that we need to do is we need to convert our symbolic DNA sequence into a numerical representation. And um, yeah, one typical way to do so is to make use of a one-hot encoding, where A is mapped onto 1000, where C is mapped onto 0100, and so on and so forth. And that is also something that you will have a look at in the a subsequent uh, tutorial uh, session. Um, yeah, then you can also have a look at the output. And um, in our case, for, for our um, problem of splice side detection, which is um, essentially a, a binary classification problem, there in output, you're going to work with a two dimensional vector, okay, where that vector consists of two elements, two components where the first element uh, represents the probability in that we are dealing with a false splice site, and where the second element or the second component represents the probability in that we are dealing with a true uh, splice site. And as also mentioned before, and so we will also apply in the softmax function in the end, and that softmax function makes it possible to uh, convert unbounded uh, outputs into normalized and outputs and that can be interpreted as uh, probabilities. And uh, of course, by definition, when we take the sum of our two probabilities, that well, that sum it must be equal uh, to one. And so that is the uh, input and, and the output of our neural network for splice site detection. Then, and we can also try to answer the following question. How does the network, how does the network learn? And um, yeah, as also uh, uh, pointed out before, and so once we have um, uh, come up with a certain uh, architecture, and so a certain number of layers and, and, and also a certain number of uh, neurons per layer, 
um, a typical first step that is then uh, made is to assign random parameter values, okay? to assign random values to okay, the weights and the biases. Okay? But of course, that these random values and uh, yeah, the neural network in question it will also uh, exhibit uh, random behavior and yeah, the corresponding uh, prediction error uh, as for instance obtained for uh, the input data set it will be very high. But of course, uh, we have that uh, input data set uh, with uh, labeled examples and um, uh, where these labeled examples uh, contain uh, the correct predictions or the correct labels. And based on that information, uh, by we also make use of uh, mathematical tools like gradient descent and backpropagation, we can, in a stepwise fashion, adjust in the parameter values of our neural network. Uh, we can search uh, for better values for the weights and the biases, so to obtain, in the end, a low prediction error. To some extent, uh, this is also visualized here uh, to the right of the slide. So here you can basically see um, yeah, a two-dimensional um, yeah, error surface, and if I can call it that way, uh, for two uh, weights, W1 and W2, where these weights uh, have been normalized. And so they take on values between zero and one, and we also have a corresponding cost. And here yeah, you can also see that um, in the beginning, when we select random values, and then we basically have a very high cost for these two selected weight uh, values. And because at that point in time, we have uh, random parameter values. And we, we, we basically make uh, random predictions. But then again, if I make use of mat these mathematical tools, gradient descent and also backpropagation, we can um, yeah, walk over in this um, surface, this error surface, towards, uh, in this case, a valley with corresponding values for W1 and W2, where the associated cost, where the associated overall prediction error is uh, much lower. And that way, we are able to actually obtain a, a better trained network, a network that can be used to uh, produce uh, more high fidelity uh, predictions. Um, in this context, and so to uh, measure the prediction error okay, as obtained for in the uh, data set of uh, labeled examples, uh, we can make use of several functions and to, to quantify or to measure that overall prediction error. And uh, one popular uh, function is, for instance, the, the mean squared error or the MSE, okay, which is um, often used in, in engineering okay, to, to obtain good estimates okay, of, of errors. Uh, but again, these days, um, when making use of uh, a binary uh, classification problem, it is also uh, quite common okay, to measure okay, the overall prediction error by making use of a cost function that is known as binary cross entropy. I'm not going to explain the cost function into a, a lot in, with a lot of mathematical detail, yeah, but I will try to, to give you um, a better intuition of what that uh, cost function is doing by again making use of an example. Yeah, and where that example can be found here to the right in, in this uh, table. So uh, what you see is the following. And so uh, in input, yeah, we have uh, a DNA sequence that represents, uh, in this case, a false splice site. And here we can also see that the network uh, predicts uh, that this is actually a true splice site with a rather low probability of 0 0.3. So that is actually uh, quite a situation that is quite good to have. So here you can see that the cost or the punishment is actually quite low. That's for a first input. And we can go to the second row into another DNA sequence. And this DNA sequence represents now a true splice site. And here we can also see that the network thinks with a rather high probability of 0 0.8 that this is indeed a true splice site. So this is actually, again, a very good situation to have. 
So here you can also see that the corresponding cost is quite low. And then we also have a third example that can be found here in the third row. You again have a true splice site in input, but here you can see that the network thinks that this is a true splice site with a rather low probability of 0 0.4. And so that is actually um, yeah, not a, good way, not a good way of thinking, if I can describe it in that way. And so here, and the, the corresponding cost, it becomes uh, much uh, larger. So and in the end, by having a look at um, all the examples available in our data set, and by also having a look at the corresponding predictions, we can build up and so an overall uh, final cost and that is actually uh, yeah, representative and for, um, yeah, for um, yeah, the behavior of our network, okay, whether our network is uh, making uh, uh, overall, from an overall point of view, uh, low quality predictions or high quality uh, predictions. And in this case, okay, where this is done, I make use of a cost function that is known as the binary cross entropy. Um, yeah, another problem, and that is uh, quite important. And these days is a problem of uh, underfitting and overfitting, and especially overfitting. And so that's uh, a problem that, that you uh, often see these days in, in the context of um, deep machine learning. Um, because yeah, often okay, people make use of um, very large networks and that come with uh, lots and lots of parameters, okay, millions to even um, billions. Um, so this means that you have a very large uh, learning capacity, but where people sometimes yeah, only have access to uh, a, a, yeah, a data set of uh, labeled examples, where the number of available labeled examples is often limited. And that is also often the case in, in the biomedical uh, setting. And in that context, you know, what you often see is then you know, that your deep neural network and that it comes with such a high learning capacity that it simply memorizes the examples in your data set. And um, in the end, when you then apply that um, deep neural network in a production setting for, for making predictions on uh, unseen examples during training, then you will see that in, these predictions are of a very low quality. And we then say that and the neural network was not able to generalize. And in that context, we also talk about overfitting. So here on the slide, you also have three panels. And so if you look at the panel to the left, and there you can see the problem of uh, underfitting. Um, so this basically means that you have uh, produced a, a model and that is actually way too simple for um, uh, or that is uh, a fit and that is way too simple and for and the data points at hand. And so here we try to fit a linear model into the different data points. And, and that is actually uh, an approach that is way too simple. And then we talk about underfitting. Uh, in the middle, you can see that we try to fit a polynomial curve of the third order into these different uh, data points. And here you can see that, that we have a good fit. Here we have a right fit. Um, and so here we have actually a proper solution. And then we also have the third uh, panel where you can see yeah, the example of overfitting. And so we have a very uh, complicated uh, solution. And so a, a polynomial curve of the ninth order, uh, which is actually doing very well for the different uh, data points because the curve is actually going through these uh, data points. And so the uh, prediction error for these data points will be very low. However, when, when you apply or when you deploy that solution um, and for making predictions for unseen examples, and then and you will see or you will obtain very low, um, um, low quality predictions. And in that case, we talk about uh, overfitting. Um, yeah, overfitting is actually um, a problem that is um, uh, yeah, well known. And there are several uh, techniques available to uh, mitigate an um, overfitting. And um, yeah, one typical way to do so is actually to simply make use of uh, more um, or to add more labeled examples to your data set. 
of course, on the condition that uh, such additional uh, labeled examples can be made available. So here on the slide, uh, these additional labeled examples, and these are the uh, yellow uh, data points. And by taking into account in these um, uh, additional data points in, during the training or during the uh, learning phase, you can see that indeed in that you can uh, force or your uh, red curve into to behave in uh, a way that is uh, less erratic in, that is uh, more close into the uh, green in polynomial curve of the third uh, order. And so you can see that you know, what we also call it that, that there's some uh, regularization um, taking uh, place. Um, Furthermore, I can also point out that um, when you're going to build, when you're going to uh, construct a, a predictive model, and then you're going to make use of typically a large um, data set of labeled examples. And for the construction of your model, um, you're also typically going to define um, uh, three different data sets. And so the original data set of labeled examples will typically be uh, split up into three subsets, uh, a training set and a validation set, and where these two sets will be used uh, during the construction, during the learning uh, of your model, and then also uh, an independent test set, and where that independent test set is in the end going to be used uh, for um, yeah, an independent verification uh, of the effectiveness of your predictive model. Um, here, I can also point out um, that the training set uh, is typically used in to look for good values for your biases and also for your weights, while the validation set is uh, typically going to be used for um, other purposes. And so, um, and so the validation set uh, can, for instance, be used for uh, model selection and for uh, finding good values for what we call hyperparameters, where these hyperparameters cannot be trained. And um, so hyperparameter is, for instance, the number of layers in your network. Another hyperparameter is, for instance, also in the number of uh, artificial neurons in a certain layer. So by making use of the validation set, you can uh, look for um, optimal uh, values for these hyperparameters. And by making use of a validation set, uh, you can also um, uh, mitigate uh, overfitting, or you can also have a look at the risk of overfitting. And if necessary, you can then apply early stopping. And that procedure is also explained on uh, the next slide. And so here uh, you can see uh, two so-called uh, learning curves uh, that are produced uh, during uh, training. And so um, on the x-axis, we have the so-called number of epochs and the number of iterations. And on the y-axis, we also have the corresponding prediction cost. And when you have a look at the blue curve, and then you can see that over the course of time, as the network gets trained, and that the overall prediction error is decreasing, which is nice behavior to have. But this is the prediction error in that is obtained for the training data set. But here you can also see we also have this yellow curve. And this yellow curve shows the prediction error obtained for the validation uh, set, for basically an independent set of labeled examples. And here you can see that at a certain point in time, in that the prediction error is again increasing. And, and that basically means that at that point in time that overfitting is taking place. And this basically means that at this, from this point in time and that the network is starting to memorize the examples in your data set. And that the network is losing its generalization behavior. So this also means that when you see this, when you see that the validation loss starts to increase, that it's actually a good idea to stop the training of your network. So to mitigate in the risk of uh, overfitting. And that is also what we call early uh, stopping. 
Okay, and then uh, let us also have a look at uh, how to evaluate um, a, a deep uh, neural network uh, once it has been trained. And as also mentioned before, so we can make use of um, many different uh, metrics from very simple to very uh, complicated. And here also would like to point out in that um, what metric to make use of and often depends on the use case at hand and also on the characteristics of your data set. And um, one important characteristic is whether your data set is balanced or imbalanced in nature. And so here to the left, you can see an example of a, a balanced uh, data set where the number of negative examples as indicated by red crosses is almost or basically equal into the number of positive examples as indicated by the green circles. And here to the right, you can see uh, an example of the imbalanced data set where the number of negative examples is much larger than the number of uh, positive examples. And here I also would like to emphasize that again in a biomedical uh, setting and that you typically need to deal with an imbalanced data set. And this situation and also holds true for our use case of splice site detection. So here you can see in the number of positives and the number of negatives for donor and acceptor sites in the human genome. And when you have a look at these numbers, and then you can clearly see that the number of positives is always much, much lower than the number of negatives, pointing to the imbalanced nature of this data set. And when that is the case, and they need to be very careful with what metrics to make use of and to evaluate uh, your model. Yeah, and that is also something I will illustrate immediately. So to evaluate a certain predictive model, so four basic values and that you can make use of, regardless of um, yeah, the, the, the use case or the balanced or imbalanced nature of your data set. Um, well, these four numbers are basically in the number of true positives, the number of true negatives, false positives, and false negatives. So what is a true positive? Um, this is basically um, a true uh, example in your data set that has been uh, predicted as being true. On a similar note, a false negative um, uh, is indeed um, a negative example uh, in your data set that has been predicted as being negative. Then on the other hand, you also have so-called false positives. And this is basically a negative example in your labeled data set that has been wrongly predicted to be false. And on a similar note, you also have um, yeah, a false um, negative. And this is basically um, a positive um, example in your training data set that has been predicted and, um, uh, to, be, um, to be false. And these are four um, basic numbers and that can be used to characterize in the effectiveness of your predictive model. And in this context, it is also common to put uh, these four numbers into a so-called so confusion uh, matrix, as can be seen here. And that matrix is then, um, yeah, often going to give you a good insight into the performance of your model. And in the end, when you, instead of four numbers, if you would like to have um, a single uh, summarizing number, then you can also calculate the accuracy, which is basically um, the percentage of uh, true predictions over all the predictions uh, made. But here, I also would like to point out that with a courtesy, you need to be very careful when you're dealing with the so-called um, imbalanced data set. Because if you make use of an imbalanced data set, and then the use of a courtesy may give you a wrong impression of the performance of your network. And so here on the slide, you can again see our uh, balanced uh, data set. To the right, you can see an imbalanced data set. And here we also make a use of 
a very simple and predictive model that always classifies each input as being negative. So this means that for the balanced data set, that we're going to obtain an accuracy of 50%. But this also means that for the imbalanced data set, that we obtain a very high accuracy of 87%. Despite the fact, as you can see here, in that all the positive examples have been wrongly uh, classified. So here, the use of the accuracy is actually very deceiving. And that is also why okay, when dealing with an imbalanced data set, okay, why it is actually a, a good idea to also make use of a number of other metrics okay, like uh, recall and position. Okay, so their definition can be seen here on the slide. And basically, okay, position is a so-called percentage okay, of positive predictions okay, that are indeed positive examples in your data set. Whereas recall is a percentage of positive examples in your data set and that we indeed classify as being positive, where, where a false negative it corresponds to okay, a missed uh, positive. And so it takes some experience to, to get used to the intuitive meaning of, of recall and precision. But basically, when you make use of these two metrics, you get a, a much better insight into the, into the prediction effectiveness of a model when having to deal with an imbalanced data set. And that is also illustrated here. And so here we again have um, that imbalanced uh, data set where everything is uh, predicted as being negative. And so the accuracy is very high, but you can see that the recall and the precision are 0%, which is very low, which is very bad. And so this is an indication that something is going wrong here. And then on the other hand, here we again have a, our imbalanced data set, but here the predictive model is a bit more subtle. And here you can indeed see that, yeah, the accuracy is, quite, is very high, 90%. But you can also see that the recall and the precision, that they are also much higher. And so here you have a more uh, trustworthy in evaluation of the uh, prediction effectiveness um, of your uh, model. And in the end, okay, when you also want to have a single number and that characterizes in the performance uh, of your network and in, in imbalanced conditions, and then you can also make use of the so-called F1 score, okay, where the F1 score is essentially the harmonic mean of precision and recall. And here also would like to point out okay, what is the most important okay, precision or recall? Well, that depends on um, okay, the use case at hand. And I think for instance about um, um, yeah, detecting and uh, corona infections. Um, okay, what is important there? Okay, is it precision or recall? Okay. And also okay, what is for instance the impact of having a, a false positive okay, or for instance a false negative? And that is maybe an interesting exercise to, to, um, yeah, to think about. But again, what is most important, precision recall, um, a false positive, a false negative, or two positive or two negative, and that is also determined by the requirements of your use case. Okay, so let me now uh, wrap up uh, my part of the session with a number of concluding and also some crit critical remarks. So in general, it is our experience that deep learning is well suited for predictive analysis of biological sequences. So you can often obtain state-of-the-art prediction performance. You can often even go beyond in that state-of-the-art performance. And also um, the most important or the, the, the strongest characteristic of deep learning is the ability to do end-to-end -end learning in an automatic way to do automatic feature and hypothesis learning on the condition that you have access to a sufficiently high number of labeled examples. I can also point out that deep learning um, is a very hot topic, especially also its application in the life sciences. And so it's, as you can see here on the graph, we have look at the number of scientific papers, and so it's um, getting more and more uh, important. And here I can also point out that 
for our use case of supply side detection, and that we also uh, received a lot of interest from companies like uh, BASF and, and Jans. And uh, in this context, I also would like to point out that um, yeah, when you have a look at the life sciences, when you have a look at the field of genomics, and these days also, of course, the field of proteomics, that large amounts of data are being generated. And um, yeah, given these large amounts of data, and that also makes it of interest and to apply deep learning into these heaps of uh, data. Yeah, some critical remarks. Um, so I um, also would like to share that deep machine learning is really data intensive. And you know, the basic rule of thumb is that you need 10,000 labeled examples per class. But in practice, you can also make use of a number of techniques that can mitigate in that number of needed uh, labeled examples. Uh, I also would like to point out that uh, neural network design, like uh, explicit programming in Python, is an art. And so there are um, yeah, no hard and fast rules available on how to create a, a, a neural network architecture and how to train in that architecture in an effective way. And so you can only learn that by yeah, doing it, by, by building up a lot of experience. Another thing is also that uh, deep machine learning is uh, sensitive to adversarial examples that is quite a fundamental problem. So these are adversarial examples are basically malicious inputs and that can force your network and to make a, a wrong uh, prediction. Um, I also would like to share that uh, deep neural network models are also so-called black box predictive models. And so we talk about hidden layers and that's for a reason because in the end, there's limited knowledge available about how a deep neural network inside how it works, very similar to the human brain. And this also makes it challenging in, in case of mistakes or errors to debug neural networks. And that is, of course, a bit different from explicit programming. And so, when, because for instance, when you make use of a, a Python function, well, a Python function is typically white box in nature. And if you have an error in your Python function, then you can rather easily debug that function. But with neural networks, it's a bit different. And finally, I also would like to point out that apart from deep neural networks, and there are also other predictive models available. And like, hey, when you, when you have tabular data available, and then it may be of interest in to make use of extreme gradient uh, boosting or other techniques you know, like uh, support factor machines and, and and all kinds of uh, tree-based uh, models. And then really to wrap up, yeah, let me also uh, give you some uh, practicalities and that may be relevant for the tutorial yeah, after the uh, break, and where that tutorial yeah, will be supervised by a SPAR. So for the tutorial, yeah, we, will, we will make use of uh, Google Colab yeah, because that uh, limits in the number of prerequisites. Yeah, so you only need to have a, a Google account. And, um, and yeah, with Google Colab, you get free access to GPUs and to TPUs and tensor processing units. There's no need to install any software packages. You can uh, easily save data and code to Google Drive. And it's also quite easy to link to GitHub uh, profiles. Um, I can also point out that uh, for the hands-on tutorial and uh, that we're going to make use of a rather yeah, simple network model API uh, that has been written on top of TensorFlow, uh, where that API is uh, essentially taking the form of uh, a Python class and uh, it has been defined on, on top of uh, TensorFlow, uh, as you can see uh, here on the slide. And uh, with that class, you can basically create a neural network. You can uh, train a neural network and can also evaluate a neural network. In the tutorial supervised by ASPAR, um, we will also have a look at uh, several tasks. And first, we will have a look at the pre-processing task, um, not requiring the network model API. And then we will also have a look at the task 
related to in defining a neural network topology then training that neural network and then also evaluating that neural network. And then in the end, and given the performance results obtained, and the idea is also to have a look at, yeah, what, what do these results, what do they mean? And so we are going to have a look at an interpretation of these results. Yeah, very quickly. And so in terms of pre-processing, and thus far will also provide you with some more context. Um, Pre-processing here is about in converting a DNA sequence into a numerical representation and by making use of a one-pot encoding. Um, you will also be asked, as mentioned before, to define two or three neural networks, a regular neural network and also a convolutional neural network, and where you can have a look at yeah, how these networks are behaving in a different way. So you will also be asked to train in these different neural networks. And you will also be asked and to implement recall, position, and F1 score so that you can yeah, evaluate in the, the different neural networks uh, trained. And then in the end, um, you will also ask you to have a look at yeah, the performance metrics or the performance values obtained and, and, and to make sense uh, of them. Okay, so that's uh, basically my part of the session. And uh, if you would have any questions or comments, then uh, please uh, let us know. Um, just for the sake of completeness, I also would like to point out that there are also some um, reference materials available in case you would like to do some uh, further um, exploration. So thank you for your uh, attention. Okay, so thank you so much. Very uh, informative indeed lecture. There is a comment and um, we actually maybe next year should make it the first presentation to, that's a so comprehensive introduction into, into the field. Um, uh, uh, because of, uh, today we are in a um, form of um normal zoom session so actually you can ask question orally but just by turning on your microphone um i suggest um actually somebody is writing in the chat how can we include information about interactions between nucleotides for example energetics so that we will have more just dna sequence um, yeah, that's yeah. I think that that's maybe um, yeah a good question. Um, um, so I I um, I do not have the the uh, yeah an immediate answer um, in, uh, available. Um, but here, so I can point out that yeah, for our research, so we we basically only make use of uh, sequence information. Uh, but these days, uh, there's indeed uh, a trend uh, to, to also try to integrate uh, additional types of, of information, uh, like um, uh, structural information, uh, information about um, yeah, the 3D uh, structure of, of um, uh, a neural network. And um, yeah, when, when you want to combine um, so these uh, different types of information, uh, for instance, um, yeah, sequence information with uh, structure information or for instance, information about um, interactions between um, nucleotides. Um, then one way to do so is um, you yeah, have to make use of, for instance, uh, multi-model uh, neural networks. And so um, hey, where, you, um, where you have maybe, um, how to say this, um, uh, a neural network that um, uh, on the one hand, it has uh, a pillar or an input for uh, the sequence information, and then another input or another uh, pillar for the information about the, the interactions between uh, the nucleotides. And so we, we have also done some, some uh, experimentation in, in that regard, but with, with um, other types of, of information. Um, one thing that I also would like to point out here uh, is the following. Um, 
So apart from uh, so-called um, yeah, one hot uh, encoding and to, to represent a DNA sequence, um, you can also uh, make use of so-called uh, learned uh, embeddings. And so um, where each uh, nucleotide is, is not necessarily represented with, um, for instance, um, uh, one zero 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 or, or zero one zero zero, but where each nucleotide is represented in the end by a floating point vector. So with multiple uh, floating point values and uh, where these floating point values um, can also encode um, different types of information or um, different behavior of, of the, the, uh, the nucleotides. And so uh, for instance, whether uh, nucleotides are um, and hydrophobic in nature or, 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 or whatsoever. And so if you would be interested in, in, in also taking in, into account in that kind of information, and then I can definitely recommend you and to also have a look at, at the usage of, of so-called um, learned uh, embeddings, and because that, that is also um, a very popular approach and to make use of uh, these days. Yeah, where these uh, yeah, learned embeddings are also often uh, obtained by making use of uh, yeah, unsupervised uh, learning techniques. Hello. Yeah, yeah. hello. Could I just shout? like this or yeah yeah just voice your question mm -hmm. perfect so i have a question we had a small discussion in the comments regarding the uh, output of the neural net you suggested to have two outputs y1 and y2 and then to do soft max of them to identify the final probability so the question is whether we actually need two variables if we do not extract any useful information from having two of them however we could because we could like give the answer like we are, we don't know what the yeah. outcome in this side, but we just do soft max at the end and we forget it. like we lose the information. Actually. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, so so here and uh, so for for uh, this design, indeed, we, we, um, we or, or or in this case, uh, Jasper, and um, yeah, we made use of of um, two uh, outputs uh, nodes in, in the output layer to indeed generate these two different probabilities. But indeed, um, you could also do the same by, by simply making use of a single uh, output uh, neuron. And that is also, that is also possible. Um, and where you also uh, could apply the, the softmax function to, to, to some extent to, to that um, uh, single uh, neuron. And so that is for sure, um, that is also possible. And, and uh, for a lot of uh, binary classification problems, they are also solved by, by uh, yeah, making use of um, a single uh, neuron in, in the output layer. So that is a, yeah, a valid uh, design uh, decision in, 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 in my um, opinion. Thank you. But like on the other hand, you could maybe just give more, like in addition to the probability of the site, you can also try to uh, give another flag whether you're actually sure about the answer or not yeah, yeah indeed 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 yeah 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 indeed um uh, so in the end yeah you can you can um um how to say this yeah you can also look into um yeah uncertainty measures and you can mm -hmm. also look into the uh confidence of, of your uh, predictions um and that is also yeah we ourselves we we do not have um, a lot of experience with that with with uh, uncertainty modeling and um, yeah, I do have um, at, at the moment uh, a, P, yeah, a PhD student who, who is looking into that kind of techniques. Yeah, but I, I do can point, yeah, I can point out that, um, that these things like um, um, uh, uncertainty modeling and, and, and also related to that and out of distribution modeling, you know, that these are two, um, yeah, very, uh, yeah, hot or these are two popular topics in, in the field uh, at, at the moment and so so um and so so indeed um uh, also looking into the uncertainty or the confidence of of certain uh, of, of your predictions that is also um yeah a highly um relevant uh, topic to 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 look into thank you mm -hmm. 